Hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Arch Study of You. I am your host, Cameron Gilmore. You know, if you're watching this on YouTube, you know when I have couples on, they're about to bring the heat. So sit down, take some notes, get ready to be inspired by two individuals that, oh my gosh, wait till you hear their story. Before we get into your back history and your accolades, um, Stephen and Brittany, um, I want to ask this question because it's it's super impactful and, I, and it will really help the stage on how this whole conversation is going to go. When you when Amazon shut your business down, held your money, you guys are scrambling to figure out something. Help me help us all understand how could Amazon do this to your company? You guys are making millions of dollars. So please take us through, you know, what happened to cause Amazon to shut you guys down and hold on to your money. So for Amazon, there's several ways that you can do business the wrong way. And there's a lot of ways you can do it the right way. For us, we were actually doing everything the right way at this point in time. We had good suppliers and everything was good and we thought we were set. And then we found out that one of our suppliers actually didn't even have access to sell the brand that we were selling. And we just assumed they were good because we worked with them in the past. Everything was all good. And then all of a sudden we get the notice that our account is shut down. We're really confused trying to scramble, figure out what happened here. Why, why are we shut down at this point? And it ended up, of course, they didn't have access to sell it. And we had to figure out how to sit there and figure out how to fight Amazon, basically um, hired a whole team of lawyers to help us try to get this store back because Amazon was not only holding money, but they were also holding inventory. Uh, it all totaled to about 100K in <laughs> funds that they were holding and inventory that we were eventually able to pull out. But of course, on any other platform, it's not worth quite as much. Something I want to talk about, which is interesting, because we've talked about this story quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But I, I think that this is one piece that we haven't spoken about, which is that supplier. And we're not going to say any names or anything like that. But I do want to implore people, check who you're learning from. Because this is somebody who was very influential in the space, somebody who has made lots of money doing Amazon. So it made sense. Well, they've made multi-million dollars. They have a million, multi-million dollar house. Like, obviously, they, they're doing something right, so I can trust them. So they had the no like, and trust factor, but we didn't do enough research. And yeah. so for those of you listening, is don't just take somebody at their brand value. Actually go and dig a little deeper, even as what we're doing here on this podcast. Yeah. So let me ask you this question, because obviously 100K is a lot. I don't care who anybody thinks. I mean, that's a whole, for some families, I mean, that's two, that's dual income in a year that people have been, oh, being held on to. What is that stress level like? Two questions. What is that stress level like? And how did you guys manage that stress level, whether it was good, bad, or ugly? Uh, so for me, what that looked like is we had a team at that time. Um, actually, we were in business. We had a business partner and they were the ones mainly funding the business and we were the ones working the business. Mm -hmm. So at that time, that looked like me driving to the nearest lake and having like a breakdown right there. I have a video recorded where I can actually remember exactly how I felt in that moment of me just feeling like I have let down all these people in my life. For me, the employees that we had were like family. Mm -hmm. And for me to let them go and then not have any income and knowing their family situations, knowing their life situations, that was extremely difficult for me to be able to feel like I had failed all of these people around me. Yeah, and I think that for me, there was... Ooh, th this is actually a loaded question now that I started thinking about it because that business partner was actually my mom. So now it's you got family ties. This is something that she's worked her entire life to have the funds for. I mean, this was from her 401k. This is her credit, everything, right? And she had bet on us and it had paid off the year before. So it made sense. And then one wrong move, just it was on the precipice of costing her everything. And so we were holding on to that way. We're holding on to the weight of the employees. And of course, we both handled that differently. For her, it was very emotional. For me, it was I ran the video games. 
I was running to overeating. I was running to watching pornography. I ran to these things to fill the hole instead of trying to dig myself out. I just kept piling dirt on top of myself. I felt like if you you have kids, so if you've ever watched SpongeBob or Mr. Krabs, oh, SpongeBob, he like is in the ground and he puts the dirt over himself. That was basically me. And it was some of the most difficult times I would remember looking back and there was times where she would just be leaned up against the wall just crying because she was taking the entire brunt of it on her shoulders. And for me, I had just left corporate. I had just left being a manager a couple of months before. I didn't know how to respond. I didn't know what to do. I didn't have the same skill sets. So in all honesty, in all actuality, and she knows this, is I was just looking at her like, hey, what you going to do? What are you going to do? Because I didn't know what to do except go get a job. And at that point, I couldn't get a job that was going to pay me the same as what I was making in the past. And it definitely wasn't going to pay me enough to get us out of this hole. Right. Yeah. Like he said, he had just come home a couple months earlier. We were in a position where we felt like, okay, this business is stable. It makes sense. Let's bring him home and we'll be able to grow it even further because he had management skills that he could bring to the table. He had He just has people skills in general that he brings to the table. So him coming home made sense at the time. And then two months later, we're sitting here, which is kind of funny. Uh, We're really big in faith. There was a, a sermon the week before where we had asked God to give us a pressing. We were like, God, give us a pressing. And we said it so loosely. And then a couple days later, our whole lives like, basically changed everything that we knew all the success that we felt like we were having it was all gone in an instant yep everything was gone right there yeah Yeah. dang how old were you guys just out of curiosity how two questions how old were you and how long had you guys been married when this all started happening so for I think it was 26. It was in yeah, 2020. So he came home a couple months after COVID because COVID in his job was just like he he was working so many hours whenever COVID started that it was just like breaking his body and destroying him completely from the inside out. Yeah. And I just remember at that time, if we're talking about that season, was that was in May of 2020. I'm having anxiety attacks for the first time in my life ever. And parts of our story is going bankrupt. Parts of our story is walking through very difficult seasons of marriage. It's walking through losing everything and living in a basement. I'd never had anxiety attacks, was having them in May of 2020, was praying and was like, what's going on here? And felt led to quit the job. So when you're asking about age, what's to me looking back, it's hilarious. At the time, it wasn't hilarious. It is It was right after my birthday. So I was 27 and it was right before our anniversary. So it was right before our anniversary is the 24th. So right before then, I think a week before was when all this hit the fan. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Guys, if, if you're listening to this on Spotify or Apple, do me a favor, go over to YouTube and watch this change that happens, right? You can see, it's still deep rooted. You can still feel the betrayal. I was think when you guys were talking, I was thinking, you know, be care of, be careful of wolves and sheep's clothing, mm-hmm. right? You guys thought, man, yeah, because you have the house, the cards, the accolades, this would be a good partnership. What I feel like is this person saw young, dumb. I'm going to take advantage because I can because I've, I'm going to keep building other things. You watch this emotional change. Watch this energetic change that happens between. Uh, Stephen and Brittany, it's because they can remember what it was like because of that core, that core, core memory. Dang, that's good. Look, guys, I told you, buckle in. We got a lot more to cover. Let me ask this question because you said something, you're praying, your faith, God was, you know, obviously you needed help from God and God. So what did God do a few months later, right? You were completely out of money. Stephen, in your own words, God gave you a gift of an opportunity Please take us through this opportunity that he presents to both of you. Yes. So with that one, it was a beautiful opportunity, not only the opportunity, but this is a beautiful moment where skill sets met opportunity. And honestly, I'm so grateful that my wife is with me today because most of the time I'm the one telling the story, but I do such a disservice to it because she was the discoverer of it. So I'd love for you to take it. Yeah. So there was something similar to what we were doing on Amazon that I discovered 
we can do this same thing on Facebook. And because Facebook was such a new platform at the time, we went right into e-commerce on Facebook and we're able to plug in our skills, plug in our knowledge and start to begin to just work. As soon as we started going, it just felt like it just felt right. I guess I just had that excitement again because we had spent months of just being depressed, uh, in our feelings, just feeling it all. And then all of a sudden we have that spark again. I think anybody who's been in business before and who has started anything knows what spark I'm talking about. Because when you have this thing that you pops up and you start to do it and it's exciting, and then you start to see a little success in it and you watch it grow, it it's just a beautiful process to be a part of. And I think that so often we've heard this terminology used before, but it is true when you get into it is it's it can become almost like a child. And that's what it what I watched it be for her, because on Amazon, I watched her go in 2018 through 2019, going from zero crying whenever she got a bad feedback or a return to someone that built the business to over a million dollars in top line sales, had six employees. I think it was almost 19,000 transactions, basically alone. And that was crazy for me to sit here and watch her do that. And she cared for it like it was a kid. She was she was up all night. She was up early in the morning. And then to if you think about it, to sit there and, and somebody to take your kid away and say, hey, you're not getting it back. Mm. Like that's such a, a and that's why it was so emotional for her was because it was ripped away from her. It was not this process of, hey, you've got so many flagged issues. Uh, this is why it's going away. It just happened overnight with Amazon. So in this moment, it was a beautiful rebirthing season where you got a restoration with this business and the skill sets you already have, where like for me, I, I had enough knowledge to be able to help a little bit, but she was really the main spearhead of it and watching it go from nothing where we're just like, hey, we've tried every other opportunity in the same space. Let's give it a shot. And since Facebook Marketplace had just released shipping, we were able to take advantage of it because the organic algorithm was insane. So we were able to get on there, post our stuff. It went from zero to 5,000 that we were able to use and keep in the first month. And that was in uh, November. And then by the end of December, we were able to help 3,300 privileged kids have Christmas. Six months, it went grew to $100,000 a month in top line sales, more than I ever made working in corporate. By the end of 2021, it was an, another million dollar business. And we were able to help 137 underprivileged kids have Christmas through raising or donating about forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000, going and finding the kids in the school system in Tennessee, in the backwoods of Tennessee, getting all the gifts, wrapping them all, delivering them all. We were Santa and his elves. And the only reason I, I say that is not to say, look at us. It's really to say, there. no matter what season you're walking through, there's always another side to it. Because what seemed like our darkest moment, a moment where we didn't know if we were going to make it out, we thought this is an opportunity for us to lose everything and be living with someone else again. But we got walked through it into a beautiful blossoming season. Yeah, something you touched on and I would like to add more to is just the process of realizing sometimes, and I think most people know this, but some people might be in a season where they can't see the other side of it and they can't see why this thing was taken from them in this season when it looks so good. Like you get excited about something and for it to be ripped away from you, you feel like it's a it's an attack. And sometimes that attack is actually what is going to launch you because this business, the first business, our bring home was not near as much because if you're in business, you know that sometimes your cost is higher higher than others. The second business, our bring home was so much more. And we may have never looked at doing this kind of thing if we were still stuck in the first thing that we had started in. So I think when you look at it, if you realize that this season is, yes, it's hard. I want to I want to totally help you understand that right now we are in a hard season. Mm -hmm. So I understand that this season is ridiculously hard. But just realize that this is for something. What is this for? Yeah, absolutely. I, I love that, especially in the capacity of when you think of 
the hard seasons is where your character is built. Mm. Not in the not in the seasons of plenty. The seasons of plenty, your character is not built. That's where your character gets exemplified. So when you're in the dark getting pressed on, when you're in the dark getting cut on, when you're in the dark crying yourself to sleep, that fortitude is what launches you into the next season. And typically, the longer the night is, the stronger you are on the other side. Yeah. So mm, mm. Can I get an amen on this podcast? <laughs> Somebody, please listen to what they're saying. Okay, before I go on a, a rant, I, I, let me ask you this question. I need to ask this, <laughs> Brittany, why not quit? Why? you Look, you're not an entrepreneur. You're not. Mm -hmm on the outside, but you are an entrepreneur. And what I'm referencing, look guys, shout out to Heartbeats. If you haven't, I'm gonna put the link to their interview in uh, in the description below and on the everything we do, because you have to listen to this. That interview is absolutely amazing. You have been an entrepreneur and a no quit attitude for years. And when I say that, why not quit? I want you to also reference on the car that you wanted to buy. When you were in high school, you had this yeah. car, you had to work, yeah. you had this yeah. no quit attitude. You both have said it. We just don't quit. Why not quit? Look, you got cheated out of something. You you lost a ton of money. You you felt horrific, went to the lake, cried your eyes out because you were responsible for people's livelihood. I know what that is like. It is the worst feeling in the world. Okay. But so so my question is, why not quit? Why not quit and just do what everybody else says? Go get a nine to five, work 40, hour, 40 hours a week for 40 years of your life. Be happy, be content. Why not quit? Yeah, I'll, I'll just kind of tell really quickly about where it started for me not quitting. Uh, you kind of touched on it a little bit, but really for me, it started in high school. I was in high school and my mom and dad had separated and she didn't have hardly any money. And if she did it, I don't, I'm not sure where I was going or anything, but she didn't have a lot and she couldn't provide me with a car that was great, honestly. So she got me what she could and I was grateful for it, but I remember very vividly, it would overheat so quickly that I would drive, our school was like on a hill. So I would drive out of the school up the hill and I would coast down the hill to my friend's house and his dad would try to put duct tape on it or he, he was just like that mechanic, you know, that just figures it out and doesn't have any of the right parts, but makes it work. So I decided that I was going to get a job and I didn't have any bills. So I just kept the money in the bank account. I didn't check the bank account at all for a couple months. And then I decided, you know what, I'll double down and get a second job. So all summer long, I'm working at 6 a.m. to 5 p.m., going home for an hour, eating real quick, and then I'm going to another job, working 7 p.m. to 2, 1, just whenever it was kind of fluid. And I just had this goal that I was going to get a car. Like, that was everything for me, was I just wanted a car that would run. And I think that that as I got older, any time I got a job, I did not feel right. Especially once my son came along, I was like, something's off here. Like I just felt like not aligned with where I was supposed to be. So whenever e-commerce came along, I had just been home with my son uh, for a couple years. And I was honestly just this sounds bad, but I was bored out of my mind. Like I couldn't take it. That thing inside of me that had birth whenever I was a teenager working for that car was longing to be sparked again. And as e-commerce came along, I saw it as this opportunity to be able to step into something again. And the reason why whenever everything went well and then went terrible that I didn't quit is because of people. All these people that I saw I could help with this process. Um, the first year we were actually, I think we were with, we had just started our second business, but we had only helped three kids that year. Mm. And just seeing that I could help these kids be able to have Christmas 
that can't have Christmas and seeing that I could help these employees who were like family, who they're all living in a house, like all generations, they're in the Philippines. So all generations are living in the same house. And most of those houses have one income and they're all taking care of each other. So the girl who had worked for me, that was her situation. She was the only income in the house. So seeing that I could help change her family's life for the better, like I knew I had to get it back. I knew I had to go back after it again. I want to chime in and just say that I'm honestly so privileged to know you mm -hmm. and I love you. And I know we've been together for a minute, but at the same time, the oh, when you sit okay. there, and you, yeah, a hot minute. But when you sit there and you talk about like fighting yeah. and persevering, the only reason that we're here is, is honestly because of you. And, uh, and at the end of it, when we sit there and we talk about articles I've been on and podcasts and everything, I always reference you. And that's why I'm excited for you to be here because people need to hear your voice because typically they only get mine, but your voice has so much with it that carries it. And that's one of those things that even for me, I remember when I met her and we were still both in high school and we're at our very first job, I saw how hard she worked and I am competitive. So I wanted to, I wanted to, I always wanted to up, one up her. So when she would when she would clean fast, because we both worked in the concession stand, I would always try to clean faster and better. But it pushed me to be somebody better. And that's what you've done our entire relationship. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for honoring me. Oh, oh my gosh. Time out. Time out. Those yeah. of you listening, come on. I mean, you need to go go listen to their interview on on the the heartbeats because you will their story is and how they met that this this the courting of it is absolutely phenomenal. So when when you look at them and go, oh, they're they're just gushy mushy, you're dang right, because what they've been through gets them to this <laughs> space. So before I go on this tangent, I'm gonna ask Stephen this question. I ask you the same question: Why not quit? Right? And I'm yeah. and I'm referencing a point when you and I had this conversation before this. Right? You said everybody in your family ha has just gone, got a job. And that was it. There was no yes. advancement. There was nothing. You're happy that you have a job. Shut your mouth. Go to work. Come home. And that was it. That was it. But you wanted something more. You wanted something better. Please take us through why not quit and why keep persevering. So for me, the reason why not to quit, I actually honor my parents for that because yeah they did it in the in the, con the confines of a job but that was their dream their dream was to have a good job their dream was to stay somewhere that provided not only the bills but they could go on vacation they could have nicer things their dream was the middle class because they came from a hard background so i honored them with that because watching them walk through that for my mom i think was 33 years and my dad was 36 when i see my parents and they tell me we never call in sick when i see my dad barely being able to walk and he's still going to work it instilled in me that no matter what you're going through keep moving and the for me that was one of those big moments but it didn't really click until i met her because i had that in in my background but once I met her and I was able to see what work ethic looked like, because, yeah, I'd seen this from my dad, but we I didn't really have great relationships with my parents when I was younger. It's much better now and I'm thankful for it. But because of that disconnect emotionally, I didn't necessarily care at the time that they had put all that work in. Like, great, thank you. But you lord it over me every single day. And so it actually almost pushed me to go the reverse way where I just wanted to lay around and do nothing. I wanted to just play games all day because I was feeling an emotional void. But when I met her and and I kind of liked her a little bit, I, I, <laughs> I basically saw her working hard, being this beautiful woman and not taking crap from anybody and especially not from herself. And that was where I watched her work. And as we got together and when we got married, watching her persevere and especially with the businesses, even when we, if we go all the way back to when we were 20 and so we just had our son, I watched her working all day and night to build this MLM. So I knew that she had this in her and that's what inspired me to quit the first job. And then, so when I came home the second time, I, I, so many times we hear it in business, just relating it back that people don't necessarily buy the product or service they're buying you. 
mm-hmm. they buy you. They're they're not betting on the horse, they're betting on the jockey. So for me is when I look at her, I'm I'm willing to go all in with her because not just because she's my wife, I was willing to go all in from the beginning because of the work ethic and the spirit behind it. Like when she when she gets into it, there's nothing that can pull her away from it. And that is what has been my biggest inspiration to not quit. My parents were one of them. And then her being the other one has really lifted me to the space where it's it's easier for me to stay in it when it sucks than it is for me to quit. Stop. We could call it a day. We could <laughs> say, hey, this has been a great episode. Up to this point, we have all learned something that lives deep down in, inside of our bodies, inside of our core, right? Of there's all there being okay with stagnant, being okay with the status mm-hmm. quo for a, for a small portion of the people is great. But for the larger portion of us, there's something deep down inside that says there's more. I have more to the, give to this life than just going to work, finding a good husband, finding a good wife. We'll talk about that in a second having kids and then just retiring and, and and being that's it. Look, for a large portion of this of the people that live on this earth, that's phenomenal. That's great. But for this other part, this inspirational part, it is there's something more to give and until I have found my true calling in life, until I found my true purpose in this life, I can't give up. Because if not, then I go back to like what you both reverted to, right? Brittany, your, your mom was poor had no money. You're like, I got it. If it's to be, it's up to me. Steven yeah. went through and said, look, I've had examples of what I don't want to become. So as much as I hate doing what I'm doing in the long hours, I don't want to be in that environment. I want to create a better environment because that's what we all do, right? We all have kids and you want to create a better environment for those. But then when you have grandkids, you're like, dang, I really want to create a a, a more abundance of an environment for my grandkids than what I have with my own kids. Dang, this is so freaking good. You can't get this a, if you don't have both of them on. I have a hot take. So, right. so you're talking about status quo. And, I have 10. Okay, she has 10. I only have one, so <laughs> I will start with me first. But the when you talk about the status quo and people getting into jobs and that being their safety net, I think that so I think that honestly every one of us are born knowing that there's more for us than where we're at. I think that the majority of people just settle because they're afraid of the pain. Mm. They're afraid of the pain of who of what it takes to become who they need to become to get to where they want to go. Because everyone sees the millionaires with a house on the beach and the Ferrari and goes, I would love to be that if only somebody would give me a million dollars, but you're not the person that could that could actually handle a million. You're not the person that could handle a $10 million mansion on the beach. And people are afraid of what do I have to give up to get to where I want to go. And so they settle for a life that is below their standards until it becomes their standard. Yeah. Mm. Look, if you don't get offended from what he just said, <laughs> then you've got no soul. Go check yourself at the door. Dang, that was good. All right. We got to hear your 10 points, Brittany. Go ahead. <laughs> I think one of them is kind of the opposite of what we've been talking about. And it's just realizing that the settle is where this stuff happens. Not settling, but when you settle your soul, settle your mind, settle everything that's going on in your life, life, that's where all of this happens. If we're constantly, and I'm, I'm totally someone who does this. And Steven's totally someone who's been a person who does this. Mm -hmm. When you're scrolling, when you're playing games, when you're watching TV, I don't call that settle. The settle is where your mind is quiet and you're getting direction on where you're supposed to go. So when we talk about this and a lot of people who are Christians, this doesn't align. The hustle doesn't align with what God wants us to do. And I 100% agree, but I also agree that we all have bigger purposes beyond ourselves. So if we're taking care of ourselves and there's nothing we can give, time, money, whatever it is, then we're going to sit here and the settle is going to destroy you, destroy what God put you on this earth for. 
instead of setting you up for what God has put you on this earth for. Mm -hmm. Which other nine? Other nine. No, we'll go okay. through it. We'll go <laughs> well, through I just it. think to, to add on to that is you have faith without works is dead. Yeah. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you got to hustle and make everything happen for yourself, but it does mean that you got to move. I heard this analogy from a friend last week where it talked about this guy where there was a huge flood hit the town and he's sitting there just barely treading water and he's praying and he's praying god save me so a boat comes up and says hey let me help you out and he says no god's going to save me mm -hmm. so then another boat comes up and he says hey let me help you and the guy says no god's going to save me then a helicopter comes and drops a line to him says hey grab the rope and he says no uh, god's going to save me then he drowns goes to heaven and said god why didn't you save me and god tells him it's like i tried to i sent you two boats and a helicopter and the thing that I've noticed being in the space, growing up in church, is I've watched people not take the active step that they were told to, that they will, instead of being obedient, they sit and wait for this miraculous, when sometimes we're being endued with the things that we need to go be the, the miracle instead of needing the miracle. Yeah. Ooh, that last statement was beautiful. Let me, let me ask you this. Give us two points. Give us two principles that you guys can share, I guess, one each of how to be still, how to just recognize your gifts. And if you haven't, what is a process that you, one could do to get into that space? Go ahead. Okay, she's going to pass me the rock. So Let's go first. <laughs> for me, something that I used to hear a lot that I thought made no sense was if you're in your 20s, go and try everything. I used to think that didn't make sense. You got to specialize, right? You got to pick one thing and just go all in on it. But then I, I, I sit there and I've really evaluated that as I'm about to step into my 30s, which is wild, is I, I actually believe that statement is true. I think that if you don't know what it is that you want to do, you don't know what your purpose is, you're not going to know it unless you try something. And that's honestly the biggest principle for business too. It's like, how do I know a business is going to be successful? How do I know what lead generation strategy works? How do, how do I, and we get stuck in the how, how do I, it's like, try it, try it and try it for a long enough period of time to know if it works or not. And it's for them to dictate what that time period is. I would say at least 90 days, but, di but dictate it by how long you've done it instead of dictating it by feeling. So often you'll start something and not see immediate results and say, oh, this doesn't work, I'm trying something else. But you don't know if you're great at sales until you've done 100 sales calls. You don't know if you're great at lead generation until you've worked on marketing material for 100 times or copywriting, whatever it is. You don't know if you're gonna be good in a, a relationship until you've been in it for a little bit. Because once you get past the puppy dog, once you get past the beginning stages, that's where you are actually found, the real you, the real them. And I think that that is, for me, when I think of settling, one of the biggest things is when you're in the midst of the fires of life is being able to disconnect from your, from what we would consider your reality. So if your bank account is dry, being able to separate from it and just say, okay, that is a part of my situation that is not my entire reality. That is not everything that makes up who I am. And being able to just go, I always suggest whether you're a believer, non-believer, it's just take time out of your day to just go be silent somewhere. If that means go sitting in your closet, go sitting in your room alone, no music, no TV on in the background, sit alone, read, do something that disconnects you. So that way you can rejuvenate your mind and your mind, will and emotions. Because especially if you're out here doing things to make a bigger impact on the world, there's going to be times that you feel so overwhelmed because maybe things aren't moving as fast as you would hope that you just get bogged down and would rather quit. And in those moments, that's when you need to go disconnect from what's happening so you can recharge to be able to push forward. Yeah, it's so good. I think for me, I think our generation, especially um, the people we've hung out with, all the people that we've been in community with, there's so many people that are confused and lost and a lot of people that are single uh, for the first time ever. And there's really two things that I feel like would change that. Is one, our generation seems to take things, it may not seem like it to like uh, the older generation, but our generation takes things too seriously. <laughs> like kind of like what Stephen was saying, like just go try like try some things. Do not think that you have to create a seven figure business in a year. Like 
my belief has always been is that if I push hard enough, if I push my head against the wall hard enough for long enough, the wall is going to fall eventually. I might try different techniques to make the wall fall. It may not just be my head. It may be my head with a sledgehammer on it or something, or I might start using my hands. But if you just try hard enough for long enough, which sounds like so simple and so basic, something will break. And the same thing with relationship, we take it too seriously. We, we look at relationships these days, a lot of friends of ours, a lot of people that we've been in community with, and we say, how do we make this the perfect relationship mm -hmm. from the start? And if anything goes awry, it's like, oh no, this isn't the perfect relationship. This is doomed kind of thing. And just for us being together at 18, married mm -hmm. at 19, 19 yeah. a, a child at 20, we may not have done everything right. And we may have healed together, but we have a stronger bond because we healed together. So a lot of people think that they have to heal from their childhood trauma. They have to heal from all of their past mistakes that they've made and find the person who will accept them for their mistakes. And it's like, it's not that serious. Stop taking it so seriously and just try. Yeah, and I think that so often, especially when you talk about relationships, like with our marriage, if you look at it statistically, there's no way we should be here. Like statistically, <laughs> married at a young age, kid at a young age, money issues, we had it all. So the top three reasons why marriages end in divorce, we had all three. So we were like 100% yeah. batting, batting a thousand, but <laughs> we're still here because instead of being a statistic, we changed the, the statistic. Yeah. And that's what I encourage everyone to do, whether you feel led to go into business if that's where you feel that you're supposed to be is you overestimate what you can do in a year and you underestimate what you can do in a decade. And I get that from Alex Ramosi, but it's so true because even for us, we, we overestimate what you can, what we can do sometimes in a month, two months, a year, instead of thinking, okay, strategically, what does it look like? Getting a vision. Where do we want to go? Yeah. We have vision for our marriage. We have vision for what we want to do. I'm glad you guys brought up marriage. I'm glad you brought up relationship and not taking things so serious up to this point. I know a lot of people that have listened to this and our listeners are watching this going, well, you guys are just, you're living on cloud nine. You, you, there's no way this is, I'm glad, I'm glad you guys are all thinking that because let, let's dive into that. You both have brought this up, Brittany and Steven, you both have brought up your marriage. You both have brought up married, dating early, married early, kid early. I mean, across the board, right. You shouldn't be where you're at. Statistically speaking, you should not be. So I need to understand, we're all going to get one to understand is why in the world are you guys still together after the heartache and the hardship that you guys have been through? For example, let, let, let me just get into this. Steven, we're going to talk about what your, what your knowledge and what you had been brought up of, this is what love is, right? Putting on mm -hmm. Putting food on the table, going to work, working hard, providing... That's love. I am showing you love because you have the necessities of life. Brittany, your your expression of love was you didn't really you had multiple, right? Your mom was married, married, divorced, been married a few times, you know, abuse in that part of it, right? And so you're like, I didn't really know what I wanted, but I, what I did want was not this. So take us through. Each one of you, when you were going through the trials of business, going through, you know, look, you guys lived in the basement. You can talk about that, living in the basement, pureeing car the carrots for your, your young, your young uh, son at the time. Take us through how to learn how to love on each other's love language and not by what you had seen growing up. I think what we had realized is we had tried to do it his way. Mm -hmm. He tried to do it his way and I tried to do it my way to a point where everything broke and we were basically at a point where it was either we end it all or we start trying to figure out how to get along. So we were just at the end of our rope and at the end of our rope, we both decided and I like to use this analogy sometimes I was holding on to a handful of sand and squeezing as hard as I could mm -hmm. trying to just hold on to it. And it was just blowing away, basically. It was in the wind. Our relationship had been in the wind because 
I was just trying to hold on to him. I was trying to control him, trying to make sure that he did things in the way that I wanted him to do them. And the communication was just me coming down hard on him anytime I wanted him to do something. And we had done it wrong so many times that the only place we could go from there was up for to me. Yeah, I think for me, and I'll go a little bit more in depth, I would love to actually talk about what the end of the rope looked like because yeah. the end of the rope for the end of the rope is so pivotal because that was the moment that decided if we were here or if we weren't here. And for me, growing up, especially because I modeled, right? I think all kids model. And I think boys especially model their father is I was modeling my dad who he didn't really express love except through putting food on the table, as you alluded to earlier. And when we got married, I was not this person. I was not the person who would be on a podcast. I was not the person who would go do things spontaneously. I did not like physical touch. It was at the bottom of my list. I did not care about anyone besides myself, basically. And that's why when we talk about trying things, we mean it. I I actually have for real research on myself that shows that what trying can do. I took the, the love languages quiz when we were at the end of our rope. And it showed that it was acts of service was number one, physical affection, physical touch was like dead last. Then I took it recently, physical touch and quality time can enter, they can swap and between two and three so it's right there now because not because it's just like oh, oh this switch flipped and i magically love physical touch it that's not what happened i actually had to make it an effort each and every day to go out of my way to give her what she needed and now you may be asking what was it that led you to that why did you wait because it was basically three years into our marriage that we stepped fully into that maybe four and the the big deciding factor was because I was working 16 plus hours a day. I was doing what, everything I thought I needed to do. She felt unloved. I couldn't understand why. And in that season, I remember her begging me just to hold her. And I told her, I said, I'm sorry, I can't be that for you. And I remember being almost a dictator of the house where I'm sitting there. I'm going to work every day. I'm the one who's providing. I'm doing everything except for really taking care of the finances. We, we didn't do a great job with that. But I just remember one day, just whenever we're sitting there and we're going through it and finding out about what happened. And I would mm -hmm. love for you to talk more about that. But when she gets into it, that was what the end of the rope moment looked like. And that was where our pivotal decision was made. Yeah. And what the end of the rope looked like for me was I got to this place where I just felt like it was over. Like it just wasn't when it was going to, it, it wasn't if our relationship was going to end. It was just when. So I went basically on self-destruct mode. I ended up making a really good friend, telling them everything that was going on in my marriage, pouring my heart, mind, soul, everything out to them. And it, just so happened that relationship was a male. And because of that connection that had been formed, I ended up being unfaithful to with that person. And so weird, because this is like the second time me ever sharing that in front of people. And it's just that that was the end of the rope that was the moment where people decide are they going to push forward do we keep going in the same direction and do we keep both self-destructing self-soothing all of those things or do we push forward and do we try again and that end of the rope moment because once i discovered it and everything started coming out i i was done like just being real transparent I was done and I was heading out to the vehicle and I was getting in my vehicle and I just remember her standing there and crying and not moving and I just remember in this moment I felt the Holy Spirit in that moment just saying you need her and in my mind it's like I don't I I'm paying all the bills like I've got everything that I think I need I've got the truck I want I've got the job I think I want I've got the promotion plan in place that I think I want and in a moment, it's like, no, you need her. And and I'm just sitting there looking at her cry. And it's 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. And in a moment, and I mean in a moment, 
I decided that I needed her. And that's what changed everything for me. It was, and again, it was not this seamless process where it was the next day we're just holding hands, yeah, we're walking through, say, it through lilies. It, it was not that. It took years. Yeah. It took me Googling and saying, how long does it take to get over this kind of thing in a marriage and saying, give me this long? This is what yeah, Google says. Years. Google says it takes two years. So can you give me two years? And he was like, I was like, bro, we've been married for four. What am I? <laughs> Two years, a long time. If we haven't figured it out by now, when are we going to figure it out? Yeah. But the fact that I, and this is where we get practical because the, the kind of person that I am and that we are is we don't just want to give you a big overview and you say, well, that's great that that worked for you, but it doesn't make sense for my situation. And a real practical is once I said I needed her and she said, give me two years is then it was okay why what was it that pushed you there one of the biggest things that helped me was i reflected on what did i do i took responsibility instead of just passing the blame on her because there was things that i did that had pushed her to that point yes she made the choices at the end but what led her there and once i started discovering i was not loving her the way that she needed to be loved it took time for me to sit there and build up this understanding to be able to love on her the way that I love on her now with holding her hand or giving her a hug or just cooking whatever it is doing anything and everything to make her feel loved it took time and that's again going back to even when we talk about business people don't want to spend the time if it's not working immediately if we don't get that instant gratification most times we just throw it out but taking the time for something that's important to me when I realized I needed her it became top priority and that's when I started like I said, holding her hand, hugging her, cleaning the dishes, cleaning up the house, just taking on as much as I could to make sure that she felt loved and going out of my way each day, even still to this day, to make her feel loved every single day. And that was such a long process. And that was the same on her end. She was having to learn how to love me for me and not love me for any other reason, but to love me. And for those of you who may be listening to this and walking through a hard season, if you put the time in, and don't give up on it. Now, I want to preface it. If you're in a in and physically or emotionally abusive relationship, you may need to seek professional help. But if it's just a situation similar to ours where maybe there's infidelity, but there was surrender of that, there was acknowledgement, a full disclosure of it, then work together to move in the same direction. Go work on yourself because there is something in you, there's something in them as an individual that led to this ultimate decision. Find what that is, do that personal development, walk this thing out together, and I promise you, you will have a, a strong relationship to the point that you can't break it if you put the work in. So I need to just kind of pause here for a second, everyone. Um, first off, we, we the millions that are going to listen to this, whether it's now or five years from now, we're all going to say the same thing for you too. One, we love that you guys never gave up on each other. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm going to say this because let me give you some more back history. Everyone that's listening to this. Steven said earlier on when he first met Brittany, he knew that he was going to marry her. This is, I want to paint this picture because we need to really understand because a lot of people are going to say, well, you had every right to leave. Yeah, of course mm -hmm. he did. But you also understand that he also said he pushed her to that point. Well, how did he push her to that point? He talked about it earlier on in this conversation. Video games, overeating, and porn. And not giving her what she needed, which was the love language that she desired. He basically told her, I can't be that person for you. So you're going to take me how I am, not how you want me to be. Mm -hmm. So, guys, you need to listen to their story and understand that, yes, they both of them had. I mean, Brittany could have just said, Well, screw you then. I need this if you're not going to give that to me. And I know what you're doing because I probably have caught you a few times, or there's things that you don't want to do that I can see and sense. I mean, look, you know, always know when people are watching porn, it's pretty easy to figure out when they're what 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 it is that they're doing, right? I mean, it's not stupid, guys. Come on. I'm not saying YouTube, but I'm saying guys that are listening to this watching this, okay? It's it, yeah. it's not dumb. You, you you can recognize it. At the same time, Steve was like, look, screw you. You did this to me, so I'm out. I'm out. Take the kid. I've got everything that I need. i got the job. i got everything. So have fun. You go figure out your life with so-and-so, and then that's just how life is going to be. But you go back to each one of them and listen to what they were saying. Their love started at 18. 
one new one new right way. I'm going to marry this person. The other one, if you, you have to go listen to the other podcasts and listen to Brittany, how she talks about how she thought about Steven. She talked about, I mean, she thought he was cute. Yeah. But then you just see this beautiful injection of a marriage. Listen, all of this is going on. The first four years of their marriage, they're trying to run a business. You don't think that's an added stress? They each, they each dealt with stress on the way that was for them, how they could cope with stress. But the one thing that they both have said up to this point is they needed to be intentional. Intentional. They had to bet on themselves. And by betting on themselves, Brittany said it, give me two years. She said two years. He was like, dude, we're married for four. That's another six. If we haven't figured this out by now, what are we doing? Guys, listen to what they're saying. It wasn't until they both tried to figure out how to love each other the way that they wanted to be loved and be intentional about it. Focus on their marriage, focus on their love for each other by focusing on allowing love for them. Stephen had to be able to say, look, okay, I don't like to be touched, but I'll give you a hug and that will work on this. Brittany had to say, okay, you're ru- you're really rough around the edges. Really rough around. Really, <laughs> guys. I'm going to spend really rough around the edges. So I'm going to figure out how to break that shell down. Mm. You don't think you don't think it was rough? Look, we can have them talk about when Steven had a massive blow up on her. And Brittany mm. handed back to and what let, actually let's go to that point. Talk about I want you to go to that point real quick. Brittany, you you back you basically were, were like, I'm done with you. You you got super angry and mad at me. Here is we're calling off the engagement. So yeah, you had a choice even then to say no. Take us through that because I think it's very, it's a very pivotal, but also a great growth moment for young people out there. Yeah. And I'll talk about it and then I'll talk about my past before that and I'll talk about now. So whenever we were engaged, we got engaged. I guess we had been together probably eight months and we got engaged. And then a couple months later, we were sitting in, I remember very vividly, I was sitting in my bed and we were having a strong conversation. Strong conversation. I don't remember what it was about, (laughs) but I just remember so vividly him starting to slam his fist on the bed and he's just screaming at the top of his lungs at me and i think there's a shoe went flying too probably <laughs> not at me not at her not at me probably just somewhere else never ever never ever um but in that moment i just decided you know what this is not worth it and the reason why i decided it wasn't worth it is because I just had a flashback in that moment of my mom was married and my stepdad, he, he, I just hear them running down the stairs and it just sounds like something falling down the stairs. And I just come out of my bedroom cause I was in the basement uh, bedroom at that time. I basically had the whole basement to myself and I guess my mom was running to, to me so that she could, I could hear her, but I was like halfway asleep. I pop up out of bed and I I went in there and he's just like on top of her with one of those big metal flashlights that we all have. And I guess you only use whenever the power goes out, but he just had one of those in his hand and he was just on top of her and he was just like hitting her with it. And I was just screaming, like, don't kill her, please don't kill her. And I was just like pulling on him and he just throws me against the wall to try to get me off of him, but he stops thankfully, because I think in that moment he realized what was happening. And so bringing it back to that night, whenever Steven was slamming his fist, I was like, I'm not going to have a marriage like that. Mm -hmm. Whenever I saw that marriage, that was different than what my parents went through. And it was her new relationship. So it wasn't something I grew up with. It was just a moment in time for me. And I just realized I will never have a marriage where this is a thing. And I figured if anger is a thing, then it's only a matter of time before that anger is being taken out on you. And to him, he was like, yes, this anger is a thing, but I would never take it out on you because that's not who I am. 
That's not how I was raised. I might hit a wall, but I'll never take it out on you. And I just, this is not a popular opinion. And this kind of sounds like I'm blaming myself in this moment. But there's so many times we as women will push a man to a certain point and then, and we'll just push and push and push with our words. And then we don't understand that their testosterone is like, I don't remember the number, but it's like 500 times higher guys. Like it's insanely higher. So they get angry when we push them and then we're mad because they're angry. But I just think it's not to blame anyone for anything, but it's just to recognize that pushing someone to, to a place where they do something, it's their responsibility, how they react, but it's also our responsibility to focus on how far we're pushing people. Yeah. And I think that it's so wildly important to sit there and realize that it was this big immaturity like I was so immature in this time and so was she like we were both very immature and the thing is there's people that we know right now who are older than us that are at that same maturity level age does not change your maturity actual experience and applied knowledge changes your maturity and when and this is something that I dove into on a podcast that hasn't been released yet is when everything was happening then in that relationship and then later when the affair happened was the walls that I had constructed what came from my childhood where my father told me that people don't have your best interests at heart rich people are evil that you can see that your mom doesn't even love you she's not even around and when and so every relationship I walk through it, it's very interesting because every single relationship that I've been in there was infidelity on the other person's part and I, in every single time that happened, it just built this leg under the table of my belief system that everyone has has it out for me. I'm not ever going to have the right person. Mm. So what it did was my defense mechanism was anger. I, I'm gonna, I'm going to destroy this before you destroy me. Yeah. And I'm not going to let the the gate down into the into my heart without a fight, basically. And that's why it wasn't just this moment because I think we're. 18 still 19 maybe mm -hmm. i was 19 you were still 18 and when this explosion happens it's because probably there was some button pushing but there was so much immaturity and walls on my end that it took like i want you guys to understand the timeline from this till the affair was five years so that means that i had those same walls for five years that none of those walls really came down, even though that there was a ring on her finger and a ring on mine, it changed nothing because there was not any self, there was no self inflection to understand who am I? Why am I acting this way? What is it? Where's the actual root of it? Instead of just looking at the branches and saying, okay, that's why. I think you looked at it during that time of this is who I am and yeah. I cannot or choose not to change that about myself. Yep. And I always wanted her to change, even when it was her needing physical affection, as I just figured if I deprived her long enough, she would not need it anymore, mm -hmm. as if she was a plant or something. <laughs> but the but that is a, a, honestly a deep look into it. We we typically don't even go that deep when it, when we talk about it on different medias. But that that look at me. I want people to understand that there was some on her part where there was many walls on her part. And then the, her childhood that led her to this moment, you heard about the terrible moment of her stepfather beating her mom. Like that is something that I hope that my son, and when he get like, I, these are things I'm trying to instill in my son. That way it doesn't, it doesn't get passed on because my dad saw it happen with his dad where his dad beat my grandmother. So he broke the cycle. And that's what I modeled. As I said, if my dad's not hitting my mom, my mom's throwing pans and different things, then that gives me that there's never a point that she can push me to. There's never a point that she can push me to that I will lash out at her. Maybe verbally, but never, ever, ever physically. And that's that hard line in the sand. And that's where, for us, we have many hard lines in the sand when it comes to our marriage. One of them is that. The other one is... The other one is we never talk about divorce. Like that's not on the table. 
We never say the D word. We don't. We don't say it because it's not on the table. It's it's also a thing where when you think about the D word, there's a lot of different ways you can put it. Uh, in arguments in the past, I used to say, "Well, why don't you just leave if you're that unhappy with how I cooked your eggs or something <laughs> like that? Like, why don't you just leave?" When you say that enough, it's almost like you're playing that game of Russian roulette where you turn around and somebody pulls the trigger, it's only a matter of time before someone turns around and they say, okay, I'll just leave. And then that's the end of it. And you're like, wait, this was just eggs. This wasn't that big a deal. And now they're gone. Yep. I need to give a shout out to my biggest sponsor, Warrior Energy Drink. The reason why we partnered together is because we have the same mindset, we have the same drive. We're, we're for the people, we're about the people. Look, Warrior Energy Drink has zero sugar options, and they got water as well. Low calories, great taste, very affordable, no crash, big energy fast, high in B vitamins, awesome, awesome design, culture design, 160 milligrams of caffeine. Other energy drinks have way, way too much, and they're always giving it back to their community. They're paying it forward. Partner with them. Guys, click the link below. Go, go get yourself your own Warrior Energy Drink and go crush today. Hey, everybody, I want to take this quick second here. A lot of you have asked me what journal do I use, my family use. Simple, this journal right here. See, my buddy Craig Smith has spent years and years developing a journal that takes everything that's up in here and puts it on paper so we can be edified and grow. So if you don't know what to write about, which oftentimes happens, he gives you ideas. And if you want power statements, things that say, I am this, he gives you those ideas. Now, if when you look at on one page, it says, this is what I'm accomplished. This is what I am statements. And there's a quote every single day that you get to write on and, and focus on. The second page is write your daily thoughts, get it out of your head, put it on paper to be the best version of yourself. The link's down below. Listen, I get no money for this. It's just, I believe in this journal. I love this journal. It's changed my life, my family's life. And if you want, it'll change your life as well.